Welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the LSE. Welcome to this public lecture. My name is Al Bimani. I'm a professor of management accounting here and also director of LSE Entrepreneurship, a new unit. Uh, LSE Entrepreneurship is, is about to kick off, and, and of course, kicking off means that we have to have a, an outstanding speaker. Uh, just a word about LSE Entrepreneurship. Our mission is, is simple. It's simply to put across the idea that there are few forces today that are more powerful than entrepreneurship to effect social, economic, and human change. Uh, so our formal launch is on 7th October, and we hope some of you will join us. Uh, now, um, uh, Peter Thiel uh, is uh, uh, featured, it turns out, on uh, the current issue of Fortune. Uh, he has put out a book which is getting an incredible amount of buzz. Uh, I think it's number six on Amazon's list uh, presently. Um, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a book, I think, that's going to um, implicate a lot of change, not just for people who are entrepreneurs or want to be entrepreneurs, but it has sort of a wide variety of uh, ideas there, I think, that um, we'll be able to take away, some of which Peter is going to discuss um, later on. Uh, just by way of introduction, then, um, uh, Peter is, is uh, an entrepreneur, he is an investor. Uh, I think some will also call him a contrarian, uh, others will call him a philosopher. Uh, he gained attention uh, initially by attempting to replace the US dollar by starting PayPal. Uh, that didn't altogether work out, but uh, he did change the way that payments are made. He did open up uh, avenues for all sorts of small businesses to operate on the internet. Uh, after taking PayPal public, uh, uh, he sold the company to eBay uh, and uh, became known as the dawn of the PayPal mafia. Uh, uh, the reason for that is that many of his former colleagues uh, started very successful uh, organizations in their own right. Uh, so there is SpaceX, and there's Tesla Motors, and there's LinkedIn, and YouTube, and Yelp. Uh, Peter himself started Palantir Technologies, a data, big data sort of uh, analysis firm, uh, very successful in getting national security contracts and starting to, uh, I think, uh, um, uh, make uh, important changes in global finance and other areas. Um, he was the first outside investor in Facebook, and uh, he continues to be on their board of directors. Uh, as a partner at Founders Fund, uh, he uh, attempts to um, encourage investments uh, that support the next generation of technology companies. Uh, Peter started also the Theo Foundation and the 20 Under 20 uh, Theo Fellowship. Uh, which helps to ignite debate on the difference that might exist between learning and schooling. Uh, some view this as controversial. Uh, I would say that if there are LSE students here who end up getting one of these fellowships, then you'll spend less time at the LSE, but you'll go on to do sort of very nice things. Uh, now, despite uh, criticisms of the education bubble uh, in spring 2012, Peter uh, uh, taught a class in the computer science department of his alma mater at Stanford University. Uh, this book has been revised and it's been rewritten, and it is now, in fact, a zero to one book, which uh, Peter is going to talk about. Um, uh, I was in uh, Portugal lying on a beach about two weeks ago and I decided to start reading the book at the start of my holidays and I have to say it was a big mistake. Uh, the reason it was a mistake is that it made me want to sort of uh, take an early flight back home and attempt to go from zero to one. Uh, now, um, uh, there, there is a, a Twitter tag uh, for those of you who um, are interested. I think it's up here. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. There it is, over there, so uh, hash LSE Theo. Uh, if you have a mobile phone, I would ask you to put it on silence. Um, uh, Peter's time is extremely limited today, uh, so we're going to have a short presentation by Peter. We'll then have question and answers. Uh, there will be the opportunity for you to, if you want to, purchase a book and having, having it signed by Peter, uh, but it does have to leave a sharp uh, at around a few minutes after seven. So uh, we, that's when we'll bring the public lecture to a close. So uh, let me then um, uh, welcome Peter, who's going to talk about how to build the future.
Thank you. Thank you, thank, thank you very much. Uh, one, one of the tremendous challenges in uh, teaching entrepreneurship or in writing a book about it is uh, that uh, there's sort of several different ways people typically do this that I think are actually not all that helpful. One is that uh, you sort of give a lecture or talk about your own experiences. And so I talked to you about what we did at PayPal in 1999, 2000, how we linked email and money together. And these are sort of these idiosyncratic war stories that are might be interesting, but don't, don't really uh, help you do anything particularly new in 2014. And then I think the other the other end of the spectrum is one where uh, where you basically treat uh, business as a sort of pseudoscience, and you come up with a formula, and it's like these are the five steps you need to follow, and if you follow these five steps, you will uh, build a successful company. And uh, the the problem with these kinds of approaches is that uh, um, every um, moment in business, every moment in the history of business happens only once. And uh, you know the next uh, Bill Gates will not build an operating system. The next Larry Page will not build a search engine. The next Mark Zuckerberg will not build a social networking site. If you're trying to copy these people, you're not learning from them. And um, and so uh, and so and so there are these sort of fundamentally paradoxical things about entrepreneurship because the critical thing is always to try to do something new. And uh, and that's probably. Um, and the, these zero to one companies that I describe in my uh, my book are are these companies that break through and do something um, new that has not been done before and that is uh, very valuable for for the world and for the people who, who start these companies. Um, so the, the the sort of the touch point of, of zero to one is this uh, question of the uniqueness of these businesses and and that's sort of so that's the that's the thing that one has a, as a th as a theme running through it. And uh, I try to get at it through these various contrarian questions. One of them is, you know, uh, what great company is nobody building? A second one is uh, um, a more intellectual version of it is, uh, tell me something that's true that very few people agree with you on, which is a sort of an interview question I like asking. And it turns out to be a shockingly hard question for people to answer uh, for, I think, two somewhat different reasons. One, one is because uh, we've been taught that truth is conventional. Truth is things that a lot of people agree on. Um, and, uh, and so it sounds already incredibly hard to come up with a truth that no one um, is aware of or no one suspects exists. But, um, but secondly, um, uh, uh, even more important, it's always a very awkward sort of a question to answer. Even if you have some ideas, um, if you're asking, you know, if, if, I'm, if I'm in an interview and I'm asking this question, um, the correct answer is one that uh, the person asking the question will disagree with. If, if the person who's conducting the interview says, yes, oh, I'd already thought of that, that's a bad answer. Um, and we live in a world in which uh, courage is in far shorter supply than genius. And so, um, and so there are sort of all these reasons um, these things are, um, are sort of often very underexplored. So um, my book gives a whole series of these answers that I've come up with over time, things that I believe to be true about business that, um, that most people disagree with me on. And uh, sort of my opening comments, I thought I would just maybe give uh, three, or, uh, three or so major uh, of these themes from, from my book. Um, uh, the, the first theme is, is this idea that, uh, um, that, uh, that uh, you know, and I sort of frame it as um, every, uh, and this is probably the over, maybe the single overarching theme is, is, that, uh, is that we think of capitalism and competition as synonyms and I believe they are antonyms. I believe that a capitalist is someone who's in the business of accumulating capital a world of perfect competition is a world where all the profits are competed away. Um, so if you want to compete in a crazy way, you should open a restaurant. You will never make any money doing so. Um, and at the other end of the spectrum, uh, what I think everybody who is a founder or entrepreneur should aim to do is build a monopoly. And, uh, and all the great companies um, that people have built um, are monopolies of one sort or another. And I sort of use Google as the uh, extreme example on, on the other end, where it's ex an extremely capitalistic company. It's, it makes enormous amounts of profits. And uh, it's so capitalistic because it's had no competition since 2002 when it definitively distanced itself from uh, Microsoft and Yahoo in the, in the core search business. Um, the, the opening line of Anna Karenina is that all happy families are alike and all unhappy families are unhappy in their own special way. And I think uh, the opposite is true of business. I think in business, um, 
all happy companies are different because they found, figured out something unique to do, and all unhappy companies are alike because they fail to escape the essential sameness that is competition. Um, the Wall Street Journal ran an excerpt in my book. Uh, the, the chapter was entitled, All Happy Companies Are Different. Uh, they sort of took the, took the chapter and they uh, retitled it, uh, Competition is for Losers, which um, uh, got a little bit more attention from people. And, um, and, it's, and I think it's, um, and it, but it sort of really gets at sort of the, the core of this, because we normally think that losers are people who don't compete intensely enough. Uh, the people who are the losers are the ones who um, fail to compete uh, really hard, and it's sort of like a, you know, you have sort of a educational testing model, a grading model, you know, sort of an athletics uh, framework or something like that. A loser is someone who's um, who's not very competitive, uh, and so if you say competition for losers, that sort of really gets at the at the core of this difference. And I, I think this um, this monopoly versus competition idea, there's, there's sort of an intellectual reason people don't understand it. Um, and it's very poorly understood, I think, even in, in Silicon Valley, because uh, the, the, people, um, the people who have monopolies pretend not to have them, and the people who don't have monopolies pretend to have them. And so it gets kind of confusing. So if you, um, and so, and, and the way you do this rhetorically is if you have a monopoly and you don't want the government to look into it too much, you will, um, you will say that you are in a much, much bigger business. That's, uh, that, uh, so if, if you're Google, you will never say that you're a search engine. You will say you're a technology company, which and technology is a vast, incredibly competitive space. And you're competing with Apple on iPhones, and you're competing with Microsoft on Word documents, and you're competing with Facebook on social, and with the Detroit car companies with your self-driving car, and there's just competition everywhere. Um, and, um, and, you know, uh, and, if you, um, and on the other hand, if, you have, if you're in a completely competitive business, let's say you're trying to open a restaurant in London, uh, which is if you decide to do that after this talk this evening, um, you, uh, um, and you try to get investors for your restaurant in London, this will be hard to do. And they'll say, well, you know, it's a bad business. No one makes money. Everyone just loses money when they open restaurants. Um, and you will say, well, this is totally different from any other restaurant. Uh, it, it will be the only um, British Nepalese fusion cuisine <laughs> within a five block radius of the LSE. And, um, and so you sort of tell an idiosyncratic fictional story where it's, it's too small. And so because people are constantly telling these uh, fictional stories that distort what's going on, um, there is this real failure to understand the centrality of this uh, monopoly uh, versus competition dichotomy. But I think there's also, I think it's not just an intellectual failure. I think it is also a sort of a psychological uh, failure. Um, and I think that we are, there's something uh, where we find competition strangely reassuring. We, um, we, we find it validating. We, we, when we, when we um, you know, uh, and when, when you, uh, you know, when you compete for things, you think um, there are lots of people doing it. And there's sort of, is this perception of safety in crowds. If a lot of people are trying to get something, it must be valuable and therefore uh, you know it, whereas if nobody's trying to do something, that's already uh, really, really uncomfortable. Um, and I think this, um, you, know, the, you know, the word ape already in the time of Shakespeare meant uh, both uh, primate and to imitate, and there is this rather disturbing aspect of human nature where people are ape-like, sheep-like, lemming-like, unbelievably herd-like, um, and we're sort of attracted to doing things that other people do. We're attracted to compete, um, for all these, uh, uh, and compete the most intensely for things that often uh, matter the, the least. Um, and you know what competition does is it does make you better at whatever you are competing on. And I'll give the high school athletics. You're on like a swim team in high school, um, and you will focus on the other people on your swim team, and you will get to be a better swimmer. But um, it always comes at the price of uh, losing sight of things that are perhaps more important or more valuable. I think that that's always sort of this, this distortion. There's, you know, there's a classic uh, uh, Henry Kissinger line um, about his fellow professors at Harvard where you know, the, the battles are so intense in academia because the stakes are so small. And, um, and you always think, on, on one level, you think this is a uh, sort of a description of insanity. You know, it's like, why would the battles be so intense if there's so little at stake? Um, but it's on another level, it is, a, it is just the logic of the situation working its way out. When the differences are tiny, 
you have to fight incredibly hard to differentiate yourself, and the smaller the differences get, the smaller the stakes get, paradoxically, uh, the more you have to fight to, to get ahead. And so I, I do think we should always ask whether um, it really makes sense to try to go through the tiny, tiny door through which everybody's trying to cram through uh, when there's a giant gate, perhaps, uh, just around the corner that uh, no one is even thinking about, uh, uh, about taking. Um, so second, um, second uh, contrarian idea in my book, um, people, uh, people think of, um, people think of uh, this question, tell me something that's true that uh, other people don't agree with you on. Most pe uh, there's sort of a default bias that uh, this question has been largely answered. We've figured most things out, or if there are things we haven't figured out, they're incredibly hard to determine. So I sort of give this trichotomy in my book of conventions, things that everyone knows to be true, mysteries, things that are just about impossible to figure out, and then there's the stuff in between which you could figure out, but it's hard uh, to do, and that's a secret. So there's a question, how many secrets are there left in the world for us to discover? Um, and certainly there are certain areas where there probably are not that many secrets left. So if you were living in the 17th or 18th century and you looked at a map of the world and there were these empty spaces on the map, you could become an explorer and you could discover something new uh, uh, on, on that map. Or if you were living in the 19th century, um, you could do basic chemistry and you could discover elements and fill out the periodic table of elements. And so in the 21st century, probably geography or basic chemistry are not places where you will discover new things. The, the fields are done, they're closed in, in that sense. But, uh, but there are many other fields, I would argue, that are still quite open and where a lot is left to discover. I think, um, I think this has certainly been true of, of the, uh, the computer revolution for the last 40 or 50 years, computers, internet, mobile internet, where you know, many, many new things have been found. And, um, and I, I think it could actually also be true of many other areas of technology where I've argued things have been somewhat slower, but they, they could be a lot faster. So it's not just the world of bits, but also the world of atoms where we could be making um, a lot more progress. I think one of the reasons people uh, think that there are so few secrets left or that it's not worth trying to find secrets is, um, has sort of paradoxically to do with globalization. You know, if you're in a world with seven billion other people, you sort of think, um, there's nothing I can find. It's like someone else will have already figured it out or it's impossibly hard. And so it's either the case someone else will have figured out this problem or it's impossibly hard. And in either case, uh, there's no point in me doing it or even trying. And this sort of becomes a very self-fulfilling uh, way in which uh, people uh, give up and, and, and do not try. And I, I think there is um, very often um, these, these great zero to one companies have some core idea or research program or a set of things that people are really thinking about where they think there is something important they could figure out and understand. At, at PayPal, we were, you know, uh, we were very focused on, on the intersection of um, cryptography and currency. Could you create a new uh, encrypted digital currency? Uh, you know, we didn't quite succeed in doing this, but, um, but by really thinking about that problem, it, it, it sort of, um, focused us on coming up with some creative solutions in the payment space and, and helped us to build this company. And, and, and so I do, think, I do think there's always this sort of passion for some uh, specific vertical where you think you can discover new things that, um, that drives things. And, and I, I want to just underscore that there are vast numbers of these secrets left to be discovered. It, it's not the case that all the low-hanging fruit has been picked. Uh, there, there was, you know, maybe there was never any truly low-hanging fruit. It was always of intermediate height. It was always somewhat hard to figure these things out, but there's a lot like this that can be, still be done. Um, a third, like, let me end with a third uh, uh, contrarian um, uh, perspective, something that's true, that I believe to be true, that uh, I think a lot of people do not agree with me on. Um, I, um, one of the, th um, very, this is a little bit bigger picture, one, one of the things I contrast in my book is uh, two modes of progress in the 21st century. I think we can have, we can have um, uh, globalization and technology. Uh, globalization I describe as horizontal progress, going from one to n, copying things that work. Um, and you know, China is probably the paradigm uh, example of globalization in our world. It's a very straightforward plan that they have for the next uh, 20 years. Just copy things that work in, in the Western world. Maybe you skip a few steps, but it's very, very straightforward. 
uh, and then um, and I always draw this sort of on the x-axis. And then on, on the y-axis, I draw technology, vertical progress, intensive growth, doing new things, going from zero to one. And this is just to underscore this idea that technology and globalization are radically different concepts and uh, that they can um, and, and they should not be used as interchangeably as they tend to get used. And if we think about the history of the last two centuries, there have been periods of technology and globalization and one or the other, and they don't actually always line up. The 19th century, I believe, was a period of enormous uh, both technological progress and globalization. Um, after 1914, globalization went into reverse, and there was less trade, less connections among the rest of the world, uh, and the world sort of fragmented, uh, part of it became communist, on and on, uh, although technology continued to accelerate in many, many domains. And then I would argue since 1971, the, since the Kissinger trip to China, uh, globalization has restarted in earnest, even though we've been uh, in a world that's been somewhat more limited in technology. It's been sort of this cone around um, information technology and the world of bits, but somewhat less in, um, in, all, in many other domains. And so the, whereas the 19th century we had both, you know, the first part of the 20th century we had um, technology but not, uh, no globalization, and the, uh, the last four decades we've had global, globalization with more limited technological progress. And, and, and this, this shift is reflected in the way that we uh, talk about the world. In the 1950s and 1960s, the world would have been divided into the first world and the third world. The first world was that part of the world that was uh, seeing accelerating technological progress. The third world was that part of the world that was somehow permanently stuck. Um, and today we would speak of the developing and the developed worlds. The developing world is that part of the world which is copying the developed world and converging to it, and it is basically a convergence theory of globalization. So this is a sort of developing, developed dichotomy, is a pro-globalization dichotomy. Um, but it is also, um, I claim, an anti-technological dichotomy because when we say that we're living in the developed world, we are implicitly saying that we're living in that part of the world where nothing new is going to happen, where it's done, where things are static, where we can expect decades of stagnation in the, in the years ahead. Uh, we are saying that the younger generation should expect uh, to have a uh, living standard uh, no better than and maybe worse than their parents. Um, and I think we should, um, I think we need to resist this idea very strongly. We should not accept this idea that we're living in the developed world. Um, and I think we should, um, we should um, instead um, um, ask much more forcefully uh, the question of how do we go about developing the developed world. Thank you very much. Uh, time for questions now. Uh, if uh, there are roving mics, uh, what I propose is that we have uh, three questions at a time. If you can say your name and perhaps a, a, a word or two about who you are, uh, you need to um, uh, keep it uh, related to, I think, uh, what Peter's talked about. No uh, pitches about uh, um, anything like that. Um, but uh, let's, let's uh, uh, I think there was a hand up there. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Reed Roberts. I'm a chemist, so I've done my PhD. So it's not quite as bad as starting a restaurant, but almost. Um, my question is, I think you mentioned Nick Bostrom towards the end of your book. Are there any ideas, sort of zero to one transitions, that you think we shouldn't be making? Can you see any that you think would actually be sort of net harmful to the world? OK, and we'll take the was uh, OK, we'll take one here. Yes, I'm Mr. Bond from Oxford, Sustainable Development. I would be interested if you can comment the relationship between entrepreneurship without any strategy. So, I mean, you have this type of entrepreneurship, but you need to have a vision. So, I'd be interested to know how Palantir is evolving toward, do you have a strategy in developing the Palantir technology? Thank you. Thanks. I think there was one more on, on that side. Yeah. Uh, John Dodds, um, in the Reddit AMA you did, you made a really interesting point, I thought, about scientific research being limited by Gresham's law. I wondered if that, if you see that also applying in entrepreneurship, both in investment and aspiration. Thank you. Wow, all right, these are really uh, cool questions. So let me, um, uh, 
let, let me start with the uh, entrepreneurship uh, without strategy. So I, uh, I am, uh, I'm a big fan of people um, actually trying to have some sort of plan uh, for the future, some sort of plan in, in starting their business and thinking where it goes. When, um, uh, the, the, and and uh, the, the bias is always not to think very far into the future because the claim is you can't know anything about the future. And so, um, and, and yet uh, paradoxically, if you sort of do a discounted cash flow analysis of any of these companies, most of the value is very far in the future. Uh, we did this exercise at PayPal in March 2001. We'd been in business for about 27 months. Um, you know, you had a very high growth rate, pretty high discount rate, but growth rate's higher than the discount rate. And so, um, so about uh, the, the, the uh, under sort of the, most of the models, it sort of showed that about three quarters of the value of the company came from cash flows in years 2011 and beyond, as of 2001. And that's roughly the math for almost all these tech companies today. If you look at Facebook, Twitter, all these companies, three quarters, 80 percent, something like that of the valuation comes from money they'll be making in 2024 and beyond. And uh, that's kind of an odd thing. Because uh, so to evaluate these businesses, you have to think really hard. Will they still be around in 10 years? And so I think um, one of the systematic mistakes people make is to overvalue growth, because that's what can be measured in the here and now. And they undervalue uh, durability, which is more qualitative, uh, but but I think um, uh, far more important uh, variable. And so it's always very important to think about durability. Um, you know, uh, people always talk about the need to be a first mover. I think uh, I think it's uh, I think it's far more important to be the last mover. You know, if you're uh, the chess analogy is if you're the first mover in chess at its white, that's about a one third of a pawn advantage. Um, last mover, you get you know you win the game, and um, and so it's you know it's uh, I think Capablanca, the former world champion, uh, is one who said you know um, you must always begin by studying the end game. So you must think about how does this uh, how does this strategy work in the long run. So I, I do I'm always a very big fan of having some account of why a business. Is, um, is not just going to tactically gain some share or some customers, but why it will have sustainably high margins for, um, for quite a long period of time. And so I think uh, you always want to have some sort of a plan. Um, you know, are there any innovations that we should, are there any breakthrough technologies we should, we should, not, be, uh, we should not be building? Um, you know, there probably are, although my, my instinct my instinct is that uh, we, we live in a, you know, we live in a world that is a sort of a, we live in a culture that is a financial and capitalist age, but we do not live in a scientific or technological age. We live in a world that's dominated by hostility to science and technology as is. Uh, and this is uh, true of most people in, 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 you know, Western Europe, U.S., uh, maybe throughout much of the rest of the world. It is true of people in government. It's true of the culture. Um, it, it really dislikes science and technology as a, as a starting point. And the easiest way to see this is if you just look at the Hollywood movies. They all sh show technology that doesn't work, that kills people, that's destructive and is terrible. And you can choose from a future that looks like The Matrix or the Terminator series or Avatar or Elysium. I watched the Gravity movie the other day. Uh, it, it was like you'd never want to go into outer space. You want to just be back on a muddy island on this, on this planet somewhere. And um, and so um, and so um, and I, I think this sort of extreme hostility to technology is somewhat exaggerated, somewhat unfounded. And so um, so even though there are a lot of scary stories that can be told, I, I I'm biased to discount them quite heavily because I think um, I think uh, you know I think they're um, um, they're sort of the product of this of this super hostile culture. And this is why by, by the way I think that. Silicon Valley or entrepreneurship around technology is the true counterculture in our world today. It is, it is, it is the most, um, it is the most revolutionary thing you can be doing in our world is to be working on science and technology, um, because that is, uh, you know, that is um, that is how you're really making a statement against uh, the sort of dominant um, sclerotic uh, world that uh, uh, that dominates us. Um, you know, if, you, if I had to pick a technology, you know, I, I, I suspect if you built, you know, computers that are smarter than humans in every way, that's kind of, that seems a little bit scary. Um, I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon, but, um, but certainly if you had, um, if you were able to build generalized AI, that would be an event uh, comparable to extraterrestrials landing on this planet. 
And uh, that's perhaps one where people understate it. They always frame the computer issue as an economic one. You know, will they take our jobs or something like this? If, um, if aliens landed on this planet, people would not ask the economic question first. They would ask the political question, are the aliens friendly or not? And so I, I do think, um, I do think uh, there's some things around AI that, if it could be built, uh, would, be, uh, would be very strange. So that's one, uh, that's one with all, all the caveats that I, I'd be a little bit nervous about. Um, the, the idea of a Gresham's Law in, um, in, in science uh, is that, uh, you know, we have, we have, you know, there's always this worry that we have all these sort of um, funding mechanisms where the, uh, that, you know, when, in many cases, the scientists um, have been replaced by people who are nimble in the art of writing applications for government grants. And, and so the, uh, and, and that the, and that these two abilities are actually quite different. That people who are good at writing grants are actually not the eccentric original thinkers who do uh, the breakthrough, uh, the breakthrough science. And I, I, this is a sort of a very big worry I have that something, there's some dynamic like this that's been going on. Uh, one of my friends goes so far as to say that he believes the government's been waging a war of genocide against scientists and sort of been, has been systematically replacing the, the so-called the scientists with people who are good at uh, writing grants but are bad at doing, uh, doing this sort of work. Um, and there's obviously a, a version of this question in entrepreneurship as well where are there people who are maybe just very good at pitching their companies and, um, and getting funding for their companies but uh, whose companies don't actually make sense. So are, the, are, the, are the great companies often started by people who maybe are somehow worse at explaining them or, or something like that? And I, I do think there's a, um, a version of this, um, um, although um, on, on the business side, you, know, you always have this uh, very tricky combination of a technology and a communication of a technology. And, and, and I'm, I'm still a very big fan of, of the two-person founding team with one person being the scientific or technological person, and the other person being the um, the sales person, the business person, um, and this is very different, of course, from a university context where everybody's on your own, and uh, you have to be simultaneously a scientist and a salesman, even though these two things are you know very contradictory. And I think the scientist and politician, it's like a philosopher king and uh, Plato. It's a philosopher's interest in the truth, a scientist's interest in the truth. A, a king or a politician is someone who has a very attenuated relationship with the truth. And so combining these in one person is, is always a, a problem. In a startup, you can at least keep the two roles separate. And, and so that's, I'm, I'm a big fan of trying to do that. Okay, that's uh, really good, thank you. Uh, perhaps we'll take some, um, some questions from the top. So we've got one over there. Thank you. And we had one over here. Hi, my name's Andrew. Um, I just wanted to ask what were some of the most interesting answers to your the Peter Thiel interview question that you've heard so far? Sorry, I'm making you run around. Um, in your book, you mentioned uh, you talk about, um, and, and you just mentioned about uh, monopolies. Um, is it possible? For, uh, and, and the idea behind this is, is is to make profits that can uh, help invest in in, in uh, future technologies. So, can companies not make uh, can companies who make tremendous amounts of profit in a competitive environment or in an oligopoly, <coughs> such as Airbus or Boeing, and in a com in competition like Apple, can they not innovate? And uh, another one on on do you see any secrets left in the infotech field? Thank you. Okay, uh, let me uh, give some. I'll try to. Makes it a little bit shorter to try to cover as much ground as possible. So, um, 
So how do we make sure that you don't create another bubble where everyone just becomes an entrepreneur um, and, uh, and you have sort of this gold rush mentality? Um, and so we have herd-like behavior in all sorts of cases. We have herd-like behavior in, in people becoming entrepreneurs. Um, and so I, I do think this is always, you know, this is always, um, always somewhat of a concern. I, you know, one of my friends I was talking to a few years ago was asking, you know, so what do you plan to do in five or ten years? And I was, oh, it's really clear I'm going to be an entrepreneur. And that's sort of like saying I'm going to be rich, I'm going to be famous. Um, you, don't, you don't become an entrepreneur as a line item on a resume. You become an entrepreneur because uh, you are, there's an important problem that needs to be solved and there's, um, and the, the best way to solve it is by starting a new company because it cannot be solved within existing organizations. Um, I try to, um, you know, I try to surface the the proper motives by uh, one of the kinds of questions I've always found to be very instructive to ask people are uh, sort of the prehistory questions. Uh, so when um, people are just starting a business, uh, uh, the prehistory questions would be like, "How did you meet? You know, how long have you been thinking about this? Tell me how this sort of came came together." Um, a bad answer to the prehistory question is we met at a, at a networking function a week ago and uh, we decided to both start a company. That is like saying, you know, we met at the slot machines in Las Vegas, we decided to get married, you might hit the jackpot, it's, it's probably just a bad idea. Um, uh, and the much better answer is we've been friends for, you know, three, four years, we, we've been talking about this a lot and we're really interested in this, where it's, it's driven not by, um, not by what the crowd is doing, but where it takes its bearings from some substantive area that you're, you're really interested in. Um, there are surprisingly few good answers to my contrarian uh, question. It's always, um, it's always sort of a very, uh, a very tough one uh, to answer. But I, th I think um, sort of a category of answers that's at least better than average and sort of gets you sort of into the A minus category maybe are, um, are ones where you acknowledge how um, how your thinking is um, not that unusual is, is 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 maybe not that 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 original. So it's uh, so it's um, it's something like um, you know I want to do an education startup because education is important. That's like hyper conventional, um, horrible horrible answer. Um, you know almost all the things that are themes. I'm by the way very against. I think uh, education startups are bad. Um, um, you know, healthcare IT is bad, SaaS is bad, big data, uh, cloud computing, that's like totally fraudulent. I don't think anybody even knows what that means. Um, you know, um, um, and, um, and, and so the good answers are always sort of very idiosyncratic. But if you say, well, I'm going to start an education software, and I know that everyone's saying the exact same thing as I am, um, at that point, you're already really far ahead. If you realize that you're not original at all, um, you are actually uh, way ahead of um, a lot of other people. So a, a pretty good answer I got along these lines was that uh, you know most uh, most investors always think you should try to buy stocks cheaply, but I think that uh, with a lot of these tech companies, you want to buy the ones where things are the most frenzied, and uh, you're just even more bullish than everybody else. And so you want to be a you want to be contrarian in a bullish way, not in a bearish way. And um, and my experience that actually there's a lot of um, there's a surprising amount of truth to that. The biggest miss I had was um, not investing in Facebook in the Series B round, uh, which was probably the steepest up round of any company uh, that I've been involved in in the last 10 years. Um, and so there is something about when there's real momentum in these companies, people often still underestimate the momentum. So I think, um, I think that was sort of a very interesting sort of uh, contrarian um, perspective. Um, so uh, yeah, so I think there's still um, enormous amount to do in the in the IT field. Um, it's it's been the field that's that's seen the most progress in the last 40 years, and um, and as a default, I would I would bet on that continuing. Thank you. Uh, I'll take some questions. Yeah. Hi, Peter. Uh, you've discussed quite a lot of the obstacles and what holds us back in terms of innovation. So, a question rather from a wide perspective: If you were to design a religion that helps us get zero to one, what would be the core values, what would be the main narra narration of the lifestyle model? Or in other sense, do you think that what holds us back in terms of innovations is rather a social kind of a cultural questions than economic questions? Okay, and uh, just, just two down from you. 
uh, something not quite like that, but I was going to ask you, what do you think is holding back those really big ideas in practical and physical terms? Is it the kind of uh, cable thing? Is it just an energy thing? There's not enough energy to get enough uh, data stored in a certain way? Or is it a physical thing in the world, whether it be an infrastructure thing? Um, is it a mental, cultural, social thing? Or what are the things that are really holding uh, big developments back, particularly not in the IT uh, software field, of which obviously you break it up? Thank you. And uh, with the, the gentleman with the gray shirt, Hello, my name is Jeff Moore. Um, I read your book, and um, in your book you talk about the US being in a state of indefinite optimism, and Europe being in a state of indefinite pessimism. So I'd like to know, what are your ideas on how we can get into a state of definite optimism? What's the blueprint? Thank you. All right, so these are, um, these are all questions of different versions of um, wh why, um, you know, uh, what's causing the slowdown? Why, why, why are we um, not advancing more quickly? And what can we do about it? I, I actually think there, there are sort of like these, I often think there's this trichotomy that one can have. There's a question, has there been a technological slowdown? So what are the facts over the last 40 years? And uh, that's sort of a complicated, uh, long discussion. I think there has been, um, there's a lot of progress in computers, not a lot elsewhere, but that's sort of what I would say on the what. Um, why this has happened is, I think, uh, important, but a very difficult question. My, my suspicion is that the why it's happened is very overdetermined. There probably are a whole series of different things. You know, we, uh, there's certain things that have been regulated very heavily. The world of atoms is more heavily regulated than the world of bits. So I think there's a regulatory component. I think there, there's sort of ways where when things work, people try more. So because IT has been working, we attract more talented people into IT and has sort of a self-fulfilling aspect. And, th and then when there are fields where there's been failure for a long time, fewer talented people go into these fields. So I think um, why is somehow very overdetermined, and there's sort of a lot of different things um, uh, that, that, that drive it. Um, but I think the question of what should be done now is actually quite different from the why one. And you can, you can probably answer what you do now without, uh, without fully having an answer to the, to the why question. It's sort of like, you know, it's like, you're sick. Why did you get sick? What are you going to do? You know, the, the questions are linked, but you can split those three up. And so I think we can always separate the why, what caused it, from the what do we do. And in fact, I think people often spend too much time on the, the why questions. It's sort, of a, it's sort of an excuse for interminable debate, and uh, it, it, uh, it um, prevents you from, from actually uh, getting to work on solving things. Um, so my, my, my basic answer is uh, the way you get back to the future does not involve you know, some sort of massive social transformation or trying to create some new religion or some new political order or anything like that. Um, I, 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 think, you know, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, and, um, and I don't think it's necessary. I think what it involves is, um, is you just, uh, just working on making the future happen. Uh, and, uh, and, and starting is, I had, I had this debate in New York with, uh, with this uh, left-wing um, um, uh, activist, David Graeber, who says, you know, we're not gonna build, um, we're not gonna build bases on Mars until we have a completely new economic system. So you have to sort of have a huge revolution, get a whole new economic system, and then we'll be able to go to Mars and build uh, bases on Mars. And uh, I would say, if you wanna build bases on Mars, the way to really start doing is, you start by building bases on Mars. And, uh, and this is sort of what uh, my, my PayPal colleague Elon Musk set out to do in um, uh, 10, 12 years ago when he started SpaceX. He started talking to various rocket scientists. How would we get to Mars? What would we do? And then you sort of start thinking about that and you sort of gradually build a company around that. The, uh, the SpaceX slogan is uh, Occupy Mars, sort of a little bit from the Occupy Wall Street movement. Um, and, um, and that's how you, uh, and it's, it's, not a, it's not a political or cultural or, or religious thing. And, and I think the more, the more general uh, thing I, I, would, I would argue is that um, because technology is so countercultural in our time, um, and you know, if you're trying to build towards a different, definite future that's different, 
you have to convince a few people of that. How do you can, you know, and you can convince a small number of people, you can start a new company, a small new company, and start uh, going in a different direction. It's much harder to convince large masses of people in our society. And so I think it's, uh, and this is why I think there's so much room for, for um, startups and why so much of this, uh, of, of progress will be driven by new small companies. Um, there's no theoretical reason it has to only be new small companies. You could also imagine it being large companies or large nonprofits or large government agencies. But because we live in a world in which people, by and large, do not believe in the future as a definite concept, um, that actually limits the ability of large organizations to, to work towards a definite future. You know, in the, in the U.S. context, um, it would be impossible for the U.S. government to do a Manhattan Project today. It would be impossible to do Apollo. You know, a letter from Einstein would get lost in the mailroom in the White House. You know, it would be, it'd be treated as a joke. Who is this man who thinks you can do all this stuff? This is so ridiculous. Um, and um, and you, would, you would never be able to sort of get the uh, coordination needed to, to make something like that happen. Um, and, uh, and, and that's why I think, um, that's why I think progress will happen in, uh, in small organizations. And if it can't happen in small organizations, it won't happen at all. Thank you. Um, I think we'll have one last round, and I'm looking for gender diversity. Um, so perhaps the, the lady here. Hi, Nandita Khanna. I wanted to ask you a little about your uh, 20 under 20 program. Uh, you've been running it for a few years now, and uh, do you feel it's been a success? Uh, is, is it only restricted to America, and do you think it has been a success? Could you tell us a little about it? Thank you. Uh, maybe somebody from, uh, yeah, maybe that gentleman. Uh, Frederic Matteucci, um, I just had a question uh, about your um, uh, value creation very far in the future and how it would apply to your stake in Lyft, because it seems that it would come after all the mistakes that Uber has done, and I would try to, to understand what makes you so confident that it can be a success where uh, Uber has generated a lot of animosity in Europe and uh, in other parts of the world. Thank you. Uh, maybe that gentleman. David Wood, London Futurist. I want to go back to your comment that all we need to do is to just get on and get things started and build a small business and uh, uh, rather than worrying too much about legislation and regulation. But aren't the uh, examples of the companies being unstuck because of the regulatory authorities getting in their way? And 23andMe, for example, or other medical improvements which uh, aren't allowed to be brought into market because of offending the FDA. So isn't there a role for at least some change in the regulatory environment to enable this entrepreneurial spirit to fly more highly? Thank you. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, let me start with the, that last question. So I, um, yes, there obviously are all sorts of things you can't do because of the regulatory environment. I think they're, they're quite, hard to, quite hard to change. And so... Uh, so we are always very hesitant to get involved in highly regulated industries. I'm somewhat hopeful that the stranglehold the, hold the FDA has on progress is going to weaken in the decades ahead because I think there's going to be more global competition. I think this is one of the really good things of China emerging. I think, um, I think uh, even Europe is an alternative to the U.S. I, th I think if you, if you have competition, I like a competition between governments always, by the way. And, um, and I, think that, uh, I think that if there is... Um, um, and I think there has been this very odd dynamic where the FDA has had a stranglehold on medical innovation effectively over the whole world. And I think, uh, it's, I think that, may be, uh, that may be starting, uh, starting to lessen. Um, we have to, however, always also be a little bit careful about, um, even though I'm, you know, I, I think the FDA is the worst agency in the U.S., and that's saying quite, quite a bit. Um, we, have to, um, we shouldn't always blame it. For, uh, for everything that's gone wrong. I, I do think that you know, a lot of the medical innovations have not quite worked, have been fairly incremental. There is a question whether the genomic stuff, how well a lot of it uh, actually works, how predictive it is. And so I, th I think, um, 
So I, even though I, th I think it shouldn't be regulated as heavily, I do think there are, um, we should always also be pushing for just having much better innovations that, uh, that simply work. Um, I, I have to be careful what I say on uh, Lyft and Uber. I'm very biased here since I'm an investor in Lyft. I, uh, so full disclosure, very, very biased. Um, I, I think that Uber is the most ethically challenged uh, company in Silicon Valley at this point. Um, and, um, and you know, there, there are sort of all these questions about what kind of behavior is, um, is appropriate in business and, and where you, you push the line. Um, uh, it's, uh, you know, I don't, I, I'm, I'm not sure it will get hit the wall in quite the same way in which uh, Napster did in, uh, in sort of uh, basically going after everybody. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, I, my own sense is that Uber is right on the cusp of, uh, of pushing the envelope about as far as, far as it could be. And, um, and there certainly is, um, there certainly is uh, certainly one of the dimensions in which you can try to differentiate yourself is to be a, be a more ethical company. And there, there are cases where that matters, uh, matters a lot. Um, the 20 under 20 program, I think, is, is tracking quite well. We're in the fourth year. We've had 83 people uh, started or, or completed. Um, they're sort of, they've raised about 60 million in venture capital. It's, uh, it's uh, you know, a number of the businesses are starting to track towards uh, you know, Series B, 100 million valuation type rounds. Uh, and so, uh, and so I think it's, you know, there are definitely some things we've learned that we're, you know, that we're going to be improving in the, in the years ahead, but, uh, but we've, we've gotten sort of more applicants every year than the past year. And, um, and it's, uh, it's really, uh, it's really been inspiring, uh, the, the, the talent people that, that, it, that it's attracted. You know, it was not really my intent with the program to sort of trigger this, this much larger debate about, uh, the nature of education and, uh, what, what is, uh, going on, but I, I do think um, it, it generated a, a lot of interest because there are these tremendous concerns about uh, what's happening with uh, the uh, university systems, and there's sort of a sense where people are you know, incredibly heavily um, vested in this. And I, you know, I'm on record as saying that I, th I think we have a bubble in education uh, in, in the um, in the United States. Uh, we have a trillion dollars of student uh, debt, um, and um, and it is it is a very it is a very tricky question, and you know, and, and, and part of the reason we have this bubble in education is because people cannot imagine any alternatives. They can't think of anything else to do. You know, it's like you go to Yale or you go to jail, or you know, it's just all these different. <laughs> there's sort of all these different variations like this, um, and um, and so um, you know, and, and I don't actually believe that there will be sort of like a single alternative system in the future. You know, I'm not. I don't believe everybody should be an entrepreneur. I don't believe everybody should start a business in the 20 under 20 program. Um, or, you know, um, I, so I think there will be no unitary future. The, the, the analogy I've used is I, you know, I think the universities today are at a, in a crisis that's maybe comparable to that the, the Catholic Church faced, say, 500 years ago. Uh, it's a sort of a universal form of knowledge. Uh, there's a clan, it's somewhat homogenous. You know, th there are some small differences between uh, people at, at, in different places. There were differences between the Franciscans and Dominicans, and they had all sorts of debates. Um, um, and um, and you have this sort of uh, priestly or professorial class that is um, that is costing uh, more and more. There's sort of an indulgence set of systems that were set up, uh, and you're you're basically told that uh, you know the only way you get saved is um, you know through the Catholic Church. Or the only way you get saved today is by getting a diploma. If you do not get a diploma, then you will go to hell, and um, and I think the uh, the somewhat uh, the somewhat disturbing message that I have is that uh, it, like that of the 16th century reformers is that uh, um, is that uh, you know uh, there is actually no institution that will save you, and that uh, you have to figure out how to save yourself, which um, is not a message people want to hear. But that's probably the that's sort of what I think um, people will understand that clearly in a post-education bubble world. Thank you, Peter. I, I think we're, uh, we'll have to close now. Uh, Peter's on a very tight schedule. Uh, I'm sure you'll join me in thanking him for his ideas. <laughs>